The next speaker is um, Dr. Simon Alvin. Um, Simon, Simon initially started his research career as a research associate in Scotland, um, and he did his PhD at the University of Pretoria. He is currently a principal research associate with the Department of Pathology, uh, the, but, but on, sorry, I have to take off my glasses to read this. Botanity, but, but, but botany and zoology at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, some people need to put it on, I need to take it off. Um, most of the work that he's done was actually done in Namibia and the Dolphin Project, and most recently he moved back to Cape Town uh, to study um, the behavior uh, adaptation that uh, cetaceans may make to different environmental conditions. Now, I had to go and Google what cetaceans is, and uh, and I think he's going to tell us. Uh, so I won't I won't I won't say what I found. But we're looking forward to your talk, Simon. Please. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Jacques. I have to put my my glasses on. I reached that age. Thank you all. I hope, I hope everyone's still awake. Uh, we're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to try and go quickly. I am a marine biologist. I study whales and dolphins. I've been working here on the West Coast for years. I did my PhD work back here years ago. And so it's a, Saldana and the West Coast have a, have a real place in my heart. And it's great that I've been able to get back here in the last few years. And, and it's a fascinating place to work, as I hope I can show you uh, in, in these slides. I'm, I'm used to controlling my own slides, so there's probably more than there should be. So next slide, please. Saldana, as you know, um, <coughs> is a fascinating area. It, it, there's a very wide range of people involved in, in this body of water, and that's why this forum exists, and it's great to be able to be a part of it. From a biological point of view, it's largely west coast in nature, uh, not entirely. And because of that, there's a little bit of overlap with some of the south coast species. I'm going to touch on that. Um, but the marine mammal component is actually not very well studied, especially within the bay. There has been work here in the early 2000s, and, uh, and then there was sort of a big gap, and, and that's overlapped with a period we've had a lot of environmental change. Next slide. Uh, so the good news um, is most whale populations, particularly large whales, have recovered very well, and uh, the, particularly around southern Africa. Uh, I'll, go into each species in, in more detail, but the bad news is that they're recovering into a world that isn't used to having whales into it. All our, our fishing regulations, our shipping regulations, how we build things, where we drive ships, how we fish, developed during the 20th century when we effectively had no whales. Um, and, and that started to cause conflict, and, and that's what I'm talking about today. Next slide, please. So the two main areas where we start to see large whale conflict with, with, um, with humans, where, where it's bad for everybody essentially, is ship strike. Uh, and ship strike is what we call it when basically run over a whale with a boat. Um, and it could be a yacht, it could be a small boat, it could be a ship, and you can see, where am I? I can point with a cool laser here. Uh, those are propeller stripes down the uh, back of this humpback whale. And this is a graph produced by the Ministry, I'm sorry, not Ministry of Fisheries, DFFE, Dion Kotzer, they presented at a conference a few years back. The, these are entanglements and whale strikes, and they are increasing in, in the record that, that they are holding. But they are also increasing because the population is increasing. Next slide. So this is what a humpback whale looks like in Cape Town when it gets hit by a fairly large ship. It is literally chopped in half. Pretty nasty way to die. Next, please. Uh, this is a southern right whale here in, uh, this is Saldana Bay. This was, I think, 2019. Um, again, you can see a big chop here from a propeller, a big chop there. Literally, it's like being been put through a slicer and dicer. Um, whale's a big thing, but a container ship and a bulk carrier is even bigger. Next, please. This is a blue whale. Uh, the largest species that ever lived. We used to catch blue whales out of Donkachat here many years back and of Durban. Southern Africa is one of the, the most amazing places for blue whales. It, it, we have south of our coast, down towards Antarctica, we, we have a recovering population. But it's still very much at the bottom of that exponential curve. I think post-COVID everybody knows how exponential curves work. There's a lot of hanging around at the bottom and then suddenly it takes off. 
the, the right whales and humpback whales have taken off, and the blue whales are still at the, the bottom of the curve. As they're starting to recover, they, we're starting to pick them up off Namibia more and more. This is the very first stranding of the species ever in Africa. It got hit by ship. So these are the conflicts we, we, we really started to face. Next, please. Uh, entanglement is another one. People are perhaps more familiar with this because these happen more often. Next slide. Oh, sorry, hang on, hold there. These are some of the statistics. So I want to highlight these are problems, but these aren't immense problems. Uh, we are lucky we, we live in a country where we have a good strandings network. We, uh, so we have pretty solid data. We have a good response in the form of uh, National Sea Rescue, have taken on responding and disentangling, and that's coordinated by SORDEN, South African Whale Disentanglement Network. So Mike Mayer gave me these stats, so it's a bit, um, uh, uh, no, text a bit small, but about 66% of the entanglements we get around our coast are, are rock lobster lines, mainly west coast. Octopus fishery was quite a big issue, and then it got solved. They started using pop-up gear, and that was in response to conflict with particularly breeders whales. So some of these problems are quite solvable. Of course, everything takes time and money. Um, fishing line, general ropes, and aquaculture is actually only around 2% of uh, overall uh, entanglements that where, where it can be assigned. Next, please. This is a brooder's whale, so this is one of the last animals that got uh, wrapped up in an octopus fishery in, this is False Bay, and then next please. This is Volfus Bay, and Volfus Bay where we've done a lot of work in, in Namibia. Uh, this is the third animal that we're aware of that got wrapped up in aquaculture lines there. So it is an issue, and as these populations are recovering, and the aquaculture and the fisheries are expanding, uh, we get more and more of these. So it's a case we need to be understand what the whales are doing, which is my job, and understanding you know, the impacts on the, on the fisheries and how we can adjust fishing and aquaculture, etc. Next, please. Um, so I just want to take you through a couple of the main species because a lot of people, when they think about whales in southern Africa, just think about right whales and hermanus, and we've got a lot more to offer. It's a really fascinating place. Next, please. <coughs> so you might not be aware of this. Well, you, you, you're probably subconsciously aware of it, but we live in a country with incredible biodiversity. We're all aware of the Feinbos being incredibly biodiverse. We also have more, this is number of whale species, a number of dolphin species. We have more species of whale and dolphin around our coast than pretty much any other country in the world. And a lot of that's because we live between two oceans. We have warm water species, next slide please, and we have cold water species. Um, I'll show you some of those now. And how do we as scientists study those? You're a very mixed audience, um, and so you, you probably don't know how we do what we do. We use a lot of different techniques, and a lot of these are sort of developed in the last few years with, with new technology, things like drones and what have you. We drive our boat around and literally count things that we see and draw lines on a map. We use, officially we call it local ecological knowledge. We sightings networks, uh, people reporting things, we formalize that, get people's opinions. Passive acoustic monitoring, we're now using sound a lot. So we put our recorder on the seafloor and it listens for whale songs or dolphin echolocation clicks. We started using telemetry very recently. We go old school sometimes, use shore-based tracking. We sit on a hill and look at the animals. You can track them with a the theodolite. Really nice because it's completely non-impact. Um, and we use photo ID, which is a way of identifying individuals. So next, please. <coughs> so in terms of the dolphins, we're here in Saldana on the west coast, and we get west coast species. That's the dusky dolphin and the, the heavy sides dolphin. Uh, heavy sides dolphins on the west coast, you see much closer to shore. So Britannia Bay is very good for them, Asia Fatane Coast. This is what you're going to see playing in the surf. They're really cute. They're endemic to the Benguela current. They're sometimes called Benguela dolphins. On the east coast, so east of Cape Town, you have these species. So we're not going to speak about those today. Next, please. But it is quite cool that where we're based in Musenberg in False Bay, it's a boundary between these species. So you can have all four species within uh, essentially the False Bay area um, as they overlap. Heavy sides dolphin, this is taken right here in False Bay. Next, please. And that's a dusky dolphin. Next, please. So this is an old slide from uh, my PhD work a very long time ago. Um, and we did boat, small boat surveys up the back line, or going up the surf, so all the way between Cape Town and Lambert's Bay. And we looked at density, and we saw really, really um, predictable density for the heavy sides dolphins. We have high numbers around, particularly around Azerfontein and around uh, Lambert's Bay. And here in the Saldana area, very, very low numbers. And I've got a whole section in this paper that says we think because of the deep water of Saldana Bay, there's no heavy sides dolphins here and um, they don't like the deep water. And it's actually, there's a genetic separation here. 
So bold young scientist that I was, I can tell you there's no heavy side dolphins in Saldana Bay really. Um, next slide please. <coughs> Then we started working here more, and usually in the past we'd really just sort of zoomed out and worked on the whales. And what, go back there, thanks. Um, what we'd seen was that you get an awful lot of heavy-sized dolphin right in a very localized patch, right in the mouth of the bay, so area where all the ships run back and forth. But we get a lot of currents mixing. We had a hydrophone in there for about a, over a year, and it picked up dusky dolphins on probably about 80, 60 to 80 percent of the days, and heavy-sized dolphins on almost every single day. It's one of the high, like, like to the point where I sent the results to the manufacturer and said, what's wrong? Like, there's, there can't be this many dolphins here. Um, and what's interesting is there's more at night. And so this is where our, us using new technology is giving us a lot more insights into the bay. These guys, the heavisides we know, have a very strong diurnal movement pattern. They tend to go offshore and feed at night. And so a lot of what we're doing limited to our boats during daylight hours is actually giving us just a, a very skewed perspective. And it's really important as researchers that, that we are open to saying I was wrong all those years ago. Uh, and in fact, Sildana Bay is a really important area for heavy sites. But interestingly, the highest numbers overlap were a period where we had a lot of boat sonars. I think there was a ship moored just off the south coast here. And um, they, they, in fact, sometimes the dolphins really enjoy the ships. They seem to stir up the sediments, etc. So as a human impact going, it's not all bad. Um, and the aquaculture zones, the dolphins are feeding within the aquaculture, within the muscle lines, because they act as, as a reef. And so from a dolphin point of view, there's not actually a major conflict in, in the Saldana Bay area. Next, please. <coughs> Watch this. So we have three species of whales around southern Africa with some regularity. We have a lot of other species further offshore that we don't need to worry about. But what we, everybody thinks about in terms of whales in southern Africa is the, the southern right whale. Uh, and that's what you see in Hermanus, in the Duhurp area, and all the way along the Cape South Coast, <coughs> where the Brutus whales which used to be, uh, they were actually named, they were caught here off Don uh, and there was a big fishery on them, on the inshore and the offshore population. This is our most endangered species. Uh, it's a population and a subspecies, but we think there are fewer than 600 in this population. Maybe fewer than 400, right? So black rhinos, ooh, super endangered. There's about 2,000 black rhinos, just for perspective, and they occur all over Africa. Um, as well. So we, we are dealing with some of the large whale species and the cetacean, the, the dolphins ha have very small populations and they just sort of, people aren't aware of that. On the other end of the spectrum we have the humpback whale which um, is borderline rats of the sea these days. Um, it's pretty, pretty impossible. You can drive from here to Cape Town, you probably like run over about 10 of them if you're not looking. Um, don't, please. Um, next slide. So I did a bit of work trying to highlight sort of key areas of concern for WWF a few years back. <coughs> and we plotted out these areas. And what's really interesting is that the Brutus whales are a south coast species. And, and we get them up into Table Bay. We never used to. But as the environment is changing, the sardines have shifted, we're now starting to get this in, in, infringement. That's not quite the right word. And the animals are, are drifting into the west coast. But we have very, very few sightings up in the Saldana Bay area. We do get them occasionally, but very few. Right whales, on the other hand, I'll go to these guys in a little bit more detail. They, on the west coast, we, we get these sort of clusters around little upwelling zones, uh, and that's because they're feeding here. Next slide, please. And the seasonality is the other thing. So the tourism industry, the impact assessment industry still tends to think about whale season. Oh, when's whale season? It's June to November. Everyone goes to Hermanus. You go to the whale festival. You buy an ice cream. You go home. Whales don't read textbooks. Um, in fact, they can't read at all. Um, <coughs> and what, we've, what we now know, well, we've known for a long time, but uh, is that the seasonality on the west coast, so north of Cape Town, is completely different to the seasonality on the south coast. So south coast, southern right whales come for winter. The humpbacks migrate past on the way north and the way south. On the west coast, they're here for feeding. And so the humpback is blue. We get, we get a migration peak around June, July. And then we get this other big peak, October, November, uh, November, December into January, and this is the feeding peak. So now, if you go out there, I guarantee you, if I was running a business, I would guarantee you a humpback whale sighting, and it's, what are we at now? Mid-November, all the way into December, I guarantee it. Right whales are also feeding, and that's changed a lot over the years, but we get the secondary peak around February, March, and this is actually a new peak. Um, they, it used to be earlier. Next slide, please. But the key point there, really, is that there are whales all year round here. Um, southern right whale, big fat thing, 
no, no, um, no doors of fin. Next, please. Uh, sorry, I, I'm going to have to try and go a bit quicker on this. <coughs> so, so this this is work done by the University of Pretoria, uh, used to be Peter Best. I worked in this data set uh, as part of my masters. So this is every year the uh, Pretoria is now taken over by Elsa Mullen. Uh, they do a helicopter survey from Cape Town to Plittenberg Bay. And you can see from 1979 to about 2009, we had this incredible, very predictable, uh, exponential, slow exponential increase of the population. Uh, during the years that I was involved in the survey, every year there were more. It was, was incredible. And then around 2009, there was this massive population crash. And the problem we have here is on the West Coast, we had work in this period. Then there was a big gap where, I don't know, everybody, somebody retired, I was in Namibia, just nothing happened for 10 years. And, and it happened during this period where all the whales just started doing different things. And so we sort of shifted into this new space now where, where very, very few of these unaccompanied or single adults of right whales in South Africa uh, on the south coast. And, but, and the, the mother calf pairs are much less predictable than they used to be. So it's affecting the whale watching industry. It's affecting impact assessments. Um, it's affecting their health, uh, etc. Next, please. But the key point there is that a population that we thought for 30 years was predictably increasing and saved sort of hit 2009 and just out of the blue numbers just fell off a cliff essentially. Um, the population is not decreasing, it's still increasing but at a slower rate. And even one of the most well studied whale populations, um, we, it's taken another 10 years to, to sort of get on top of what's happening. This is what used to be happening on the west coast. This is satellite tag data from, it was done in 2001. Uh, and and Peter, so Peter Best was my former supervisor. They, they were involved in this work. And essentially the right whales would sit in this upwelling plume. If you've ever looked at a satellite image of this area, this little upwelling plume where the wind blows and, the, and the, all the chlorophyll sits. And that's what the, the whales are eating, the copepods that are feeding on the chlorophyll. Very predictably. They had a whale just sit there for three months, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, for three months feeding. And then when the numbers all fell off the cliff, this has sort of shifted and we're not seeing that anymore. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and Else and her team are now doing some satellite tagging and starting to get on top of what's going on here. So these are some of the satellite tags they've employed. And what we used to think was that the right wheels were coming down here somewhere. And Else's work has shown quite nicely that some of the animals have started shifting uh, the feeding ground into the southwest Indian Ocean. And, and some have even crossed the Atlantic all the way to South America and come back. And the point here I want to make is that they're not your whales, and they're not my whales, they're not our whales. <laughs> they, they're global whales. These animals are crossing ocean basins. And impacts that we have here, if we run over a humpback whale or a right whale, those, those whales are linking across the ocean. Um, and so these transboundary stocks become very challenging to manage. And, and there's a shared responsibility that you know, we, we need to be aware of. And likewise, if this whale's getting you know, hit by a whaling ship or, or krill is, is being taken down here, that's, that's of our interest too. Um, and you can see some of these feeding animals are starting to pick up, but this is not happening much later in the year. It's happening in that February or earlier, later in the season, February, March, whereas it used to happen in November. And we don't really understand that yet. Next, please. So we've done a lot of work now off Saldana over the last few years. All these little grey dots are where we've driven our boat. And we've only really had right wells during, um, uh, I can't remember the month, but once or twice sitting out here right in the mouth of the bay and they were feeding. So we had no right wells, no right wells, no right wells, and we had 20 that were kicking around for about a month and then moved back and forth between Cape Town and here. And these are the ones that are quite vulnerable to shipping impacts, etc. This is a map from the early 2000s. It's obviously not clear uh, at this distance, but in North Bay, we used to get a lot of mating right whale groups. And North Bay is where, of course, there's now aquaculture. And that happened in the early 2000s. Everybody kind of went away and got distracted for a few years by retiring, and I was traveling, um, what have you, come back. We just, we don't see that anymore. And, and you, you guys are here more than I am. You tell me if I'm wrong. But in all the time, I've now been working here quite a lot of the last three years. We have not seen a single right whale in North Bay. So, so these are populations that even though we think we know what they're doing and they're big and they're slow and they're predictable, they're not predictable. Um, their behaviors, their numbers are changing on, on scales of just a few years. And that's really important to push that, that long-term monitoring is, is maintained for these kind of populations. <coughs> um, oh, and also I said we don't really get brooders whales here, so it's hard to manage with this. Um, but we did have one day in June where we had six brooders whales feeding and they came right into North Bay. And these are the guys that are a little bit smaller and a little bit uh, sleeker. So if they get entangled, they tend to get stuck. Whereas the humpbacks and the right whales are bigger and stronger. They're more like bulls. 
Um, whereas the, the right, uh, the British whales are more like, I guess, like a racehorse, you know, so they're, they're, they're not as strong, they can't tow or break the gear, and these, these are the very vulnerable ones that were um, uh, suffering with the octopus fishery. And so far less predictable, but again, one day we had six British whales just popped up on the west coast. You gotta understand the, diff the distance between here and Cape Town, you know, on a yacht, it's, I don't know, overnight, by a car, it's a few hours, and to a whale, it's, it's an afternoon swim. And so for, for them to pop up and down, they can do that quite quickly. So even though on paper, um, as much as we've tried, we didn't see them, if we'd missed them by a day, we might not have seen them at all. They are here, and these are the ones that are really hard to predict, uh, but also they're the ones that are the most vulnerable. Next slide, please. Um, just skip on to the next one. There's lots of whales, it's all bad. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanna keep going so we don't run into tea too much, I don't know about you guys, but I'm hungry. So this is a nice picture of a humpback whale entangled straight off Saldana Bay here. Next, please. Um, so humpbacks are a little bit different. They actually migrate past our coast. So they're definitely not our whales. We get them going up the east coast, up here to, to Mozambique and Madagascar. And the west coast, they go all the way up to Angola and, and Gabon to the warm waters and they migrate back down the Benguela. And what happens, next slide please, is that they stop in the southern Benguela. Well, in the northern Benguela as well, in, off, off Ludrith particularly, where they start feeding. Next slide. And we call this supergroup feeding. I'll show you a slide now. And thanks to, to the power of a program called Happy Whale, uh, this is an open access program. You just sign up and you, you load up your whale tail photos. Essentially, every single whale tail, humpback whale tail in the world is unique. And this incredible piece of software, you load in a tail and within seconds, it'll match you to every single fluke in the world and tell you, this might be a North Pacific whale, in which case we'd write a paper about it. <laughs> it's never, if it is, it's usually wrong. Um, but it'll match very quickly. And over the last, has been pushed by a gentleman called uh, Alex Vogel locally, he's just a keen whale watcher. Um, and he's really taken this on to, to get everybody's photos and load them in. And we're now sitting with an incredible database. It's two, two thousand, I think we're about 3,000 or 4,000 photos, mainly from the supergroup area where we have so many animals. And this is going to be able to al allow us to um, uh, start getting population numbers and residents. And a lot of the animals we're seeing here are, are, are resident or semi-resident. We started to get these recaptures within seasons and between years, which is really incredible. And key, we're seeing what we thought was West Coast animals. So we thought these were animals all going up and down to Gabon. We're now seeing a lot more matches coming across from the eastern side, from the east coast, our east coast. Um, and from, there's a lot of data here that still needs to go in. And, and from the Brazil population. So again, these are transboundary animals. And, and what we're seeing here, it's very easy. It's something I pick up as, as a scientist. I get to work in a few different places and be aware of other people's um, um, data and findings. And I do often hear from people, that, oh, you know, this thing's happening. There's no whales this year because that new car power shift is here or that new uh, aquaculture industry is here. But with these large whales, they're being affected by global scale things. They're being affected by the El Nino. But it's also important that, that, that what we're doing and what the Brazilians are doing, it's, it's all shared population. Next, please. <coughs> so what are they doing here? They're feeding. This is what they're feeding on, these little tiny krills, euphorsia. <coughs> Next, please. You may have seen this photo, it won some awards. This is Jean Trafons, this was taken off Half Bay. But, but incredibly, if you actually Google humpback whale feeding, you don't see underwater photos. So these are Jean, I'm, I'm sure many of you follow him on Facebook. He, he flies around his gyrocopter and he's doing a lot of it at this time of year. A very good photographer too. Uh, and, and these are these incredible images of animals feeding. You can see all these little speckles in the pictures, not dirt, those are, that's the prey. Next please. Um, and this is what these guys are doing. And when animals are feeding, there's, there's two components to it. Sometimes they know what they're doing and they're paying attention. And other times they're just like lost in the moment and become, they become much more vulnerable. And this is what we're trying to work to understand because they, they're feeding and they're not paying attention to the ships overhead, etc. Next. <coughs> so this is what these feeding groups look like. Um, I didn't, I didn't, honestly, I didn't have a wide enough lens to photograph it. Uh, Jean's got a nicer picture. Uh, Dave was, uh, I did a sand park survey with Alison Cock on, in the helicopter. These are incredible, incredible groups. This is a globally unique phenomena. Um, these animals are aggregating and they're feeding. If you get a chance to go out there with a, with a whale watching boat, they're now running out of Azerfontaine. It, it's worth doing. Um, it, it's a mind blowing experience. You're surrounded by 100, 200 animals and they're just largely ignoring you. And they're just feeding and doing their own thing. It's really incredible. Next slide. <coughs> now imagine one of these big bulk carriers, I think that's the right term for them, just plowing through that in the dark one evening. Remember all those pictures of chopped up whales I showed at the beginning? To be honest with you, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. And, and this is what we're trying to work to understand, how these animals are, are responding to ships. Uh, next, please. 
Yeah, so we're using a range of techniques. We've done shore-based monitoring. We've had hydrophones out. And, and last year, we were lucky to work with a colleague, Natasha Aguilar, uh, who, who works with these things called D-tags. It's essentially a Fitbit for a whale. And you stick it on with suction cups. I was going to show you a video, but uh, I, I couldn't get it to, to run properly. Essentially, you drive up right next to the whale, and you poke it onto its back, and it just sits there with suction cups. Um, and afterwards, you have to you know, tell it which way is forward and that type of thing. But out of these tags, we're getting acoustics, and we're getting high um, acceleration and movement parameters. Next, please. So out of the acoustics, so this is a combination of work we've done recording animals or, or um, from boats and from, from moored hydrophones, and we're decri describing the repertoire of these calls. Uh, so when they're feeding, they're making a lot of these sounds. And what we're trying to do is link some of these sounds, or any sounds specifically associated with feeding or surfacing events that we can use sounds detected to say how many animals are there, or are they feeding, or are they traveling, etc. And this is a work in progress. It's been a bit delayed, but Rachel, who's here with me today, is uh, starting as a postdoc soon, and she'll be working on a lot of this data. Basically, these are just variations on whoop and whoop. They're not actually that exciting sounding. Um, if you string them all together, it sounds kind of cool. Um, but I try not to play talks. Sounds in talks. <laughs> it never works. <laughs> Next, please. Um, uh, is that going to work? That's a little gif. So a couple of years back, we did some work out of Cape Columban Lighthouse, and we've done some work of um, Seldana Northhead, thanks to Jacques letting us in there. Uh, and we're you know, trying to track whale groups and numbers around, um, around these hydrophones to, to link this. So, so we don't have the, the final numbers yet, but it, it's not looking particularly linear. The problem is, as you can imagine, in some ways acoustics is an incredibly powerful tool. You can tell there's humans in this room if you just listen, if you have your eyes closed, but you can't tell how many humans are in this in room. Mainly you'll just hear me droning on, but actually there's whatever, 200 people in here. But perhaps in 10 minutes when it's tea time, then you'll know there's more than one person. And we kind of have the same problem with the whales, and this is what we, we're trying to tease out going, going forward. Is there a way that we can be like, there's one whale, there's 10 whales, there's 100 whales, just from the sounds alone. Next, please. Uh, and so we've done a lot of boat surveys, and last year we put out these D tags, so that's the colored bits, and the colored, uh, the colored bits shows that we, we got a nice sort of sampling of the different areas, and we put these tags out for between two and eight hours. Next, please. <coughs> So this just zooms in on the animals that we tagged that were right outside Saldana here. So we had a team on land watching them or trying to watch them. We put the tag on and we stood off. So we didn't watch what the animals were doing because we didn't want to interact their, uh, affect their behavior. And um, we were hoping we'd get more ships passing by so we could start to look specifically at how the whales were responding to the, to the boats. Um, or did, it, did they change their movement towards or away from boats? Did they change their diet parameters? And that's what we're going to be looking at soon. Next, please. But just as a, as a precursor, this is a dive profile. This is on the two from two different individuals. So you can't see the axes here, but this is uh, 12 hours. This is 8 hours. This goes down to 90 meters. So the, this animal and this animal were both feeding. So you can see dives down, and these are just multiple dives. Down, up, down, down, down. And at the bottom, it just does this sort of several, several gulps at the bottom. And you can see how incredibly predictable it was. Basically, spent four hours just doing exactly the same thing, diving down to between 60 and 80 meters gradually follow the krill layer down and gradually follow it back up again and breathing down, multiple gulps, up, down, up, right? And you can see here, this, w this is a sort of 10 to 15 meters that I've just marked out. That's, that's your danger zone for hitting ships, right? And so this is where we want to be looking at going forward. You know, you, how much time do they spend up here versus down here? So this is clearly feeding and then this is exploring. So it's much less predictable. So we can now tie this in with the spatial movement and we'll be doing that. Next, please. Uh, same idea, this animal is doing much more exploring, so far less predictable, but we also get the acceleration out of it, so you can see where it goes yellow here at the bottom, that's when it's doing these little fast flicks as it accelerates to take a mouthful of food. So really incredible tags, uh, amount of data we're going to be getting out of these, and we hope to do some more uh, into next year. Uh, next, please. Uh, yeah, so just to, to summarize there, I know we've run over time, we're, we're eight minutes over, but we have two large whale species feeding in this area for multiple months of the year, um, and bred as well, as well on a less predictable way, uh, less predictable seasonality. But there's whales in every month of the year. Uh, we have large numbers of humpback whales, and the right whales look like they're coming back. We have a high overlap with the sh shipping channels, um, and, and we don't seem to have much o overlap with aquaculture at the moment. We did in the past, and it might change back. We don't know unless we're looking. Um, but we really don't have a lot of formal sort of description of what's going on. But, uh, but the key thing is things have changed. Things are continuing to change. 
Um, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to be trying to work towards it to mitigate it, because it's in nobody's interest to be hitting whales. Next slide, please. Um, you know, from an animal point of view, they get injured, they die, they, they get entangled. Um, noise pollution, we don't yet understand how the noise pollution is affecting the animals. These are sort of targets going forward. We, we need to be looking at individual and population effects. Um, you know, and the, and the human impact of this is, is damage to, to vessels and injuries. I know when yachts run into, the, into a whale, um, it, it has caused quite serious injuries to people in the past and damage to the vessels. If a whale gets entangled in your aquaculture farm, it's going to cause massive damage. Um, I've heard of cases where, where the ships have just had to sit and wait for the feeding groups to get out of the way. Removing carcasses is looking at least 100,000 rand to get, a, to get a carcass off the beach for a day. Um, and, and of course, it's illegal to kill a whale, actually. Um, and so you, you are, if, you, if you're careless and, and hit a whale or kill a whale, you're potentially vulnerable to being sued by Greenpeace or something. I think that's the end. Just one more slide maybe on going forward. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to look at ways to reduce interactions and overlap. And when interactions occur or unavoidable, uh, is there a way to reduce the impact? And, and the key things that are, that are sort of being tested glo globally are things like moving shipping lanes, uh, changing shipping speeds. Uh, the aquaculture industry have been involved in a little bit with some of the, the work there. There's a lot of thought already going into where those, those farms are built and how they're built. Um, so it's a case of keeping on top of this uh, and, and seeing where it goes going forward. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So just. I just want to say, so going forward from here, last slide please, WWF, no, yeah, whatever, go back one to that, that thing, I uh, thank you. Um, so Philip, who I haven't even met yet, he's here somewhere, uh, is here from WWF and they've managed to get some funding from, uh, uh, from Vodacom to be looking at putting in a, 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 a whale alert system and I'm hoping we're going to be working with them a bit more, feeding some of our data in, into that project. So this meeting's already happened, I unfortunately missed it um, and we'll be catching up later. But it's a really great initiative, and uh, there's a l but there's a lot to think about in terms of the understanding the whale behavior and what we're trying to get out of it, um, and, and is it sustainable in the long term. South Africa has had some great successes with projects like the Shark Spotters and various Crime Spotters projects. So we certainly have the experience locally to, to make this happen. I'm going to leave it there because we all need tea and coffee. It's 41, so we're not that late. Thank you.